How has the pandemic impacted the way local governments operate and deliver public services? What are local governments doing differently in the aftermath of the pandemic? And how can local governments work with stakeholders to bring back local economies? I will explore these questions and much more with Tad McGilliard and Laura Kaderis from the International City County Management Association, ICMA, and contributors to the IBM Center special report, COVID-19 and its impact, seven essays on reframing government management and operations. You know, innovation and transformation, as you point out in your essay, are often born out of necessity. How has the challenge of the current pandemic produced creative change in local government administration and operations? Well, this is Laura, I'll chime in here. And I think that the exponential growth of the public health threat and the rapid onset of the lockdown just really forced governments to adapt at a much quicker pace than normal and to also live with a certain degree of ambiguity. So they really had to be okay moving indefinitely into spaces where they might not have been completely comfortable or felt like they had anticipated all of the hiccups. So one early example were public meetings. There was an obligation to keep government business running. And so you had communities turning to whatever off the shelf software or platforms were easiest to deploy, whether that was Facebook or Zoom or Microsoft Teams, so that they could hold these meetings virtually and without disruption. Um, you also had communities that at least initially couldn't get around the face-to-face -face requirements. So they turned to meeting in unexpected outdoor places like parking garages um, or sort of quasi-outdoor places. Um, and then another thing that we heard a lot about was figuring out ways to really quickly repurpose assets and staff when their old function no longer make, made sense. So that could mean using infrastructure for childcare facilities or to facilitate broadband access, or even the opening up of the public right of way to allow dining or greater pedestrian use as we saw in a lot of communities across the country. You mentioned the length of this pandemic. We're almost on the year anniversary when the shutdown started. How has the nature and longevity of the pandemic prompted a collective rethinking of how local governments respond to emergencies? Well, if I might, I'll build on what Tad was saying. I think that this last year has really demonstrated the intersectionality of different types of emergencies. So you had this giant invisible threat that impacted the entire world, which itself is interesting since you can compare how other places did this or did not do this and what that meant in terms of outcomes. Um, but as things unfolded and we were all really stuck in front of screens and data nonstop, it quickly became clear how disproportionate the impacts were on people of color and other segments of the workforce and communities. And then you layer on what Tad was just talking about, the natural disasters, the wildfires, the storms, and you need to help people get through those safely but without exacerbating the COVID threat. And then you layer on the civil and political unrest of last summer and so for one thing, I think that it has underscored the need to think about the root of these inequities and how some people are disproportionately impacted again and again, and how to start to configure systems so that people aren't at such a disadvantage from the get-go. And also I think the intersectionality of response, the local, the state, the federal is an ongoing conversation that we're still having as well. I'll just throw in just a couple more thoughts to this one because I, um, you know, I think Laura has, has phrased it correctly with the intersectionality of emergencies. I mean, we um, we have tried as as local governments and as associations, as organizations, and businesses all over the world, trying to stay as far ahead of the disasters we possibly can. But it keeps throwing new wrinkles at us, and so um, you know, it's very important, I think, for local governments to keep this in mind as future events and disasters like this play out. That um, the length of time that it takes to recover may require you to start thinking. Um, longer term about when particular phases of a disaster phase might actually come into play, whether it's planning, recovery, long-term restoration. Yeah, as a follow-up, uh, I'd like to ask you both, as I was reviewing and editing your piece, you know, what you mean by hot washing approaches? What, what is the term hot washing? And, and how can uh, the hot washing of approaches uh, used during the COVID-19 pandemic, inform and update hazard mitigation and disaster recovery plans in real time? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, and and we, we try to avoid jargon and speak in uh, you know, the Queen's English as often as we can. So apologies for, for uh, 
letting that slip into the report for you guys. But um, you know, hot washing is simply just a, the, the the comprehensive systemic review of you know what's going right, what went not so well uh, in an event, and then you know in this case, um, it's almost like an after action reporting uh, process, which is something that local governments do. Um, they're already doing. We've we've done several presentations over the last few months of things that local governments have done. Um, to better understand what, again, what they've done well, what they've not done so well. You know, I, I would imagine uh, as local governments are doing this, that, uh, you know, an example of a what didn't go so well is dates right back to the beginning of the pandemic is, um, boy, it would have been really great to have a much more resilient stockpile of PPP on hand um, when the pandemic was rolling out versus the, you know, the mad scramble that we saw around the country and around the world to find, you know, different kinds of ways of um, covering up your nose and your mouth so you didn't spread the disease. So you both point out in your piece that the pandemic has disproportionately devastated segments of local economic activity, bars, restaurants, hotels, you know, tourism, arts, and entertainment. I was wondering what is being done to ensure the stability of small businesses, which, as you so eloquently put it, are often the central nervous system of local economic ecosystems? Um, I'll talk. I'll start real quick, I guess. Um, you know, first off, there's there's help on the way. Today is the day that the, the, the stimulus package, the latest stimulus package was, was passed by Congress. It's now going to the White House, and there's a lot of um, support in there for some of these kinds of entities, and there has been in previous um, federal packages as well. You know, one of the things that we've, we've noticed, uh, what I think has been very interesting is sort of the, 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 the non-governmental partnerships that have been created by local governments inside their local communities and in their regions with organizations like Chambers of Commerce, um, Community Foundation, National Philanthropies, universities, anybody who had an opportunity to step in and provide some support, local governments were very creative and trying to create these partnerships with with organizations to do things like support small and and micro business enterprises. You know, local governments have also been able to do some things on their end as well that may not um, be like direct payments like you're gonna see from things like PPP loans and such, but they've been able to waive fees and fines and licensure requirements and all those kinds of things that, that it takes to operate a business um, inside a jurisdiction, they've been able to waive um, some of those or at least delay them and, and allow local governments to not have to make those payments um, on the same timeline or same time frame that they might have in, 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 in normal times. And I, I guess I would just, the only thing I would add is, is that as trying as this last year has been on, on families and households, there has been a pretty perseverant spirit of communities coming together to support uh, small businesses to support beloved community institutions. And, you know, a lot of that's on a more volunteer basis and local governments have varying roles in facilitating that. But I, I hope, I expect, and I hope that that will be sustained as we begin to see, you know, the, the vaccination percentage creep up and, and we see these literal signs of life as we head into spring here um, about, you know, approaching the, the other side and air quotes of this, of this event. So how has the move to online and virtual engagement impacted the way local government employees do their work? Uh, What are some of the challenges being faced by local governments in the area of workforce staffing and development? And and maybe perhaps you can talk about how these challenges are being addressed. I'll start on this one. Maybe Ted has more to add, but um, kind of continuing on my my engagement soapbox, I, I think that we continue to learn lessons about how to use these tools most effectively. So one of our members had pointed out, um, she's several months ago, and I, I agree with her that you know, running a Zoom meeting is, is really more of a, a planning and community development role or, or area to exercise that expertise than it is an IT function. So um, while at first it was like, find the person who's most adept at running the, those Zoom controls, you know, if we're thinking about using these longer term, who within your staff is has that expertise um, and is the right place to to hold that uh, role. And then we've also talked about the customer service expectations, obviously getting more in line with the private sector for for a while and especially now, so that there can often be this pressure to respond immediately to an issue or a question, um, or especially in this last few months, um, an example of misinformation or disinformation. 
So that really underscores the need for up-to-date social media policies and crisis communication strategies so you know who speaks and when, and that's especially important in a decentralized work environment. Um, and then that also raises uh, attention to cybersecurity threats and the need for continued training on that, which I know Ted may probably may want to add some more thoughts on. Since yeah, I mean, just the, the cybersecurity effort is, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that local governments thought that much about um, just five or so short years ago. And then all of a sudden you had a major event happen in Atlanta and then follow on major events in places like Baltimore. So you know, the cybersecurity threat, when you when you start elevating, increasing the number of vectors and you move people off site and they're using technologies on their home networks, you do create some um, enhanced risks for local governments to, to, to make a misstep because an employee responds to a phishing email, which suddenly opens up the entire enterprise um, to a cyber attack or a ransomware event. So, I mean, there's lots of you know, things that local governments have had to figure out on the fly. Some of them have done it successfully. Others have run into challenges um, uh, along the way. So what other advice or guidance can you offer to keep innovation and transformation moving forward in local government management and operations? I'll start. No, I'll, I'll just refer back to some of the data that we have on hand to, to kick it off. But we, we did a survey in, in 2016 or 17. Laurel, you can correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, but it was focused on innovation and in, in local governments and what how they approach innovation from a policy and programmatic standpoint. And three of the primary factors that were highlighted as inhibiting innovation in in the local government was the lack of awareness about how to proceed, the the organizational culture which dampened enthusiasm for inter- innovation, and then also a, a lack of internal expertise for how to even proceed. Um, uh, with a with an innovative mindset uh, about tackling you know existing challenges in the communities, you know I, I, I actually I have very few original thoughts. I feel like I'm just quoting lots of people sometimes as we're going forward. But we we Laura and I found uh, one of the great quotes I think that we've stumbled across in the in the last few years, and we're using it in some of the other content that we're writing. But it's it's by a, a former ICMA member way back in 1918, at the literally in the beginning of the last pandemic, and he's given a speech at our annual conference, and he says um, something to the effect of, "Someday we shall have managers who have achieved national reputation by successfully leading their commissions into great new enterprises of service. The great city managers of tomorrow will be those who push beyond the old horizons and discovered new worlds of service." And I think what we've sort of tried to indicate throughout this interview, and I think through this paper and, and a lot of the other research that we've done, is that there have been more innovation in the last year that's happened in local governments where city managers, county managers, their staffs, their partners in the community, um, the entire ecosystem of organizations and stakeholders that, that work to make great places uh, or working to make their places greater have been pushing beyond those those old horizons and, and finding new ways of uh, of helping their constituents, be they individual citizens or residents or small businesses. You know, we've got some really great examples, and we didn't have a chance to get into them in, in the report, but there's some wonderful examples which are popping up where managers are, again, challenging those old horizons and pushing past them to deliver vaccines. And Laura mentioned these earlier, but we've got a a couple of communities which we're about to profile, one in Florida and another one in Illinois, both of which got their hands on some COVID-19 vaccines and, and quickly set up vaccination pods for their elderly residents and those others who are really struggling um, to use the online registration tools. And so there's there's plenty of examples out there like that. And I, you know, I think one of the one of the missions and the important things that organizations like ICMA, quite honestly, you know, Michael, the, the work that the IBM Center for the Business of Government does is to keep putting out those, those innovative ideas, whether it be in, in content or interviews or educational sessions and all the various things that that, that groups like our, our two enterprises do every day. I would maybe just just tack on here. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't really um, add to those comments about the, the sustaining the transformation and innovation, but just maybe as a compliment, um, I think it is also still really important to um, acknowledge explicitly just the basic sort of professionalism of these local government managers in, in making the best out of a, a really dire situation. Um, 
I, you know, we, with our survey, we also had asked um, several months into the pandemic about impacts on, on their workforce in terms of layoffs and things like that. And, and we found that they were really making, doing whatever they could around the edges to try and keep their people employed and to not have to significantly um, impact in, uh, investments in infrastructure. In fact, some were saying, we're putting our money into infrastructure because that's going to pay off uh, on the other side of this crisis. So, um, and you know, so much of this vaccine rollout, as frustrating as it has been, um, it's it's outside of the control of a local government manager, and they are just doing everything they can to fill in the gaps and get people to the right information. So, um, just not to discount the importance of that work too, in addition to all of the innovative and transformative thinking. This has been a special edition of the Business of Government Hour: COVID nineteen and its impact a series on how the pandemic has transformed government management and operations with Tad McGilliard and Laura Caderas from the International City County Management Association, ICMA, and contributors to the IBM Center special report, COVID-19 and its impact, seven essays on reframing government management and operations. Subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app. And as always at businessofgovernment.org.